Hi, folks. I'm here with Melanie DeRigo running to represent New York's third congressional district. She ran once before in 2020, and now she is back and better than ever. And she's here to talk about her campaign. Melanie, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Mike. It's great to be back. Really excited to be here with you tonight. Very excited to talk to you. So, okay, I I have to ask this to every single person who's running twice in a row. Why? (laughs) I I know it's difficult. Running for Congress is really a tremendous amount of self-sacrifice. It's exhausting. And a lot of folks who are running for Congress are still working full time. They have families. So uh, what made you want to run again? I know that you increase your chances when you run that second and third time, possibly. But what made you want to do this again? Right. Well, look, you know, we, as you know, I ran in 2020 as an insurgent candidate and uh, we got a little under 30 percent of the vote in a global pandemic, being outspent nearly 20 to one with the inability to knock doors. Right. Uh, yeah. and so I think, you know, doing as well as we did up against the barriers we were up against really showed me that. Uh, our message was resonating, right? And guess what happens when you show up for people and you fight for policies that are going to improve material conditions for people? They respond, they get excited. Uh, and, you know, it was really wonderful because, you know, we, I ran for office and the team that we built, we're, we were all just so passionate about pushing for progressive policy and real change that, um, you know, it, it, it was wonderful to see such a positive response from the community, right? And so even though we weren't successful necessarily with the outcome that we wanted, we were still successful in educating people on policy and moving the needle. I mean, we moved people from staunch, you know, uh, no, a- you know, positive toward the ACA, but no way Medicare for all, all the way to Medicare for all supporters. And we built a beautiful coalition, right? And so even though I didn't win the election, our job wasn't done. You know, we still um, or or we've been building every day since then. And, you know, I didn't know if I was going to run again right away. But I do know that uh, I need to show up and fight for my community. So I've been in the community each and every day, uh, building and and pushing toward the policies that, you know, I'm fighting for. Uh, And, you know, at the end of the day, it just came down to there's so much on the line right now, Um, you know, in terms of the policies that we need pass, you know, uh, the climate crisis is one, but so healthcare is another, we're still in a global pandemic and literal lives are on the line, you know, and I, I think you know this, but for your viewers, hi, who don't know, I'm a mom of three, I have three children, 11, seven and four. Uh, and so I don't have a choice. Like, I have to run, I have to fight for their future. So, you know, we're back this time around to finish what we started. And this time we're going all the way. Yeah, I, I'm really excited that you're back. Anyone who runs a second time, I think that that's really, really important, especially given how well you did. I mean, I don't think people realize that that disadvantage monetarily is so difficult to overcome. But to get nearly 30 percent with how little you raised, I mean, you raised a substantial amount for grassroots donations. But just to do what you did with that little money compared to your opponent's. It's honestly outstanding. I wanted to ask you, what's the biggest thing that you think you've learned and improved upon with the second campaign? Because everyone who I talk to who runs twice says that they feel like they know a lot more now. Like they kind of have been a little bit on the inside. They see how the sausage was made um, and it's ugly. But now they realize, okay, we have to focus on money. We can get uh, a little bit more bang for our buck in terms of money and mailers. Uh, What do you think is the biggest takeaway from your first campaign that you're bringing into the second campaign? Yeah, well, I think that there's a few things, right? We certainly learned a lot in the last election um, and, and, you know, both what worked and what didn't work and what we could have done better. Uh, this time around, you know, no one likes to hear this, especially uh, coming from the grassroots, but money is important. So we are yeah. spending a lot of time on the phones uh, and there's a lot of fatigue right now. Uh, people yeah. aren't, you know, they're, they're feeling, uh, I think, disengaged at the moment. So, you know, we're, we're spending... A, anywhere between 50 and 70 hours a week on the phones. And that's wow. rough. Yeah, it's rough. Uh, but we're doing it because it's important. You know, we need, to, we know we need to raise money to win and uh, winning is the only option this time around. So, yeah. so that's what we're doing. Uh, the other piece that I think is really important this time around, we started very early. Uh, last time I kind of entered the race fairly late. I was one of the um, last candidates, you know, in terms of in the candidates, at least in New York, this time around, I was out front early building support. Um, and we continued to build our coalitions, right? And I think that's really important. 
Uh, and I think showing up in, you know, and this is something I think we did really well last time. And it's something we'll continue to do this time is just, you know, showing up at as many community events as possible, listening to uh, folks all over the district uh, at every demographic and finding out what's important to them. Uh, and, and, you know, education, because uh, a lot of folks, you know, as we know, right, a lot, a lot of politicians like to gaslight us on what they believe and what policies are. And uh, so we, we really try to be truth tellers and engage people uh, in, in true civic discourse and debate. Uh, and we educate on policy. And I think that's how we're able to build, you know, the diverse coalition that we've built. Uh, and that's very, very exciting. But yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's no way to sugarcoat it. You know, you have to raise the money uh, if you want to win. And, and so we're very focused on that this time around. Yeah, yeah, that, it, it's good to know. It, it's a sad fact of reality. But if we pretend as if that's not the case, then I feel like we're not going to be as equipped as we can be going into uh, these races. One thing that I wanted to um, ask you about is so in a lot of these states, especially New York, we're, we're learning a lot this year with India Walton and whatnot. Um, the state party apparatus is almost always dismissive of progressives running for Congress, such as yourself. Um, so I wanted you to talk through the dynamics of your race. Is there like already an establishment favorite in who they're seemingly backing? Um, is there an incumbent Democrat that you're, you're running against? Is there like other big money candidates that are kind of coming in and not really doing much, but they're just collecting cash because they have those financial interests? Um, talk through the dynamics because some of these races are so stacked with candidates. Some of them have like uh, no joke, uh, more than 10 candidates. And so um, it's it's interesting to think about, you know, do you think that your chances go down with more candidates? Um, I, I mean, obviously, statistically, it's less of a likelihood. But how does that like how do you compensate for that as someone who isn't raising big money? So you're kind of like there's this fear that you're going to get drowned out by everyone else. So uh, talk about the dynamics of your race and how you overcome these sorts of challenges. Yeah, well, you know, first and foremost, we're trying to raise big money, right? So we're hoping we'll get right. there from the grassroots. And, you know, so far, we're feeling pretty good. Uh, but yes, in terms of the dynamics of the race. So in 2020, I ran against uh, the vice chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus, Tom Swazi. Um, this time, this, you know, 2022, I entered the race intending to run against him as well, it, which, you know, we, we believe would have been an epic to person race. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, just very recently, things changed and he announced he was not going to seek reelection for the third congressional district. Uh, he's running for another office. So, uh, you know, we're now the clear front runners, which is very, very mm -hmm. exciting. Um, you know, we are the only candidate in the race right now, or we're the only campaign mm -hmm. in the race right now. Um, you know, we do expect that to change. There are a lot of rumors. Yeah. You know, of course, redistricting is happening. Um, and I think there's a lot of folks potentially waiting to see what that looks like. But, um, you know, we'll see, you know, we we're hearing rumors that, you know, there's multimillionaires that might jump in, you know, there, it's of who course. knows, right? Because that's what we need more rich people to control us. Yeah. Um, but here's what I'll say. And this is why I think this race is so exciting. And I, and I actually believe it's going to be one of the most exciting house races of 2022 because we've been building for years in the district. I am the only person that I know of um, from an organizer perspective or even, you know, versus a sitting elected official that has built infrastructure in each area of the district. Um, this is a district that spans three counties, um, part of Suffolk County in Long Island, part of Nassau County and part of Queens, which is part of New York City. Mm. We have a massive volunteer base in each county. Uh, we have a ton of support. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but we actually have 13 endorsements already. Uh, and it's still pretty early. Yeah, we, um, you know, That's as soon as Yeah, yeah, as soon as we launched um, on the first day, we launched, in fact, the national I was actually the first candidate of the cycle to be endorsed by brand new Congress, the National Organization for Women, Moms in Office, Her Bold Move, Matriarch early endorsed me, uh, just received the National Indivisible endorsement, along with like Rep. Pramila Jayapal and Mondaire Jones. And uh, the New York Progressive Action Network, a couple of the, um, you know, regional players there as well. Uh, Zephyr Teach Out endorsed our campaign. And just yesterday, we were endorsed by No IDC New York, which was a, an awesome, awesome grassroots mm -hmm. organization, if you're familiar, that worked to um, essentially oust Democrats that were caucusing with Republicans, which sounds a lot like my race last time. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Listen, you know, we are... 
we're full speed ahead. You know, the momentum is here. We've been having rallies and, you know, in, in December, in the cold, you know, 70 people are showing up, you know, and, and this is, that's impressive. This is, this is exciting. This, because you, I, I truly believe when you give people something to show up for people mm -hmm. show up, when you show up for people, they show up for you. And that's, you know, that's why I know we're going to win this race. That's so exciting. It, the fact that right, like it's definitely going to change, but the fact that you're kind of the only one right now that gives you such a good amount of um of uh, opportunities, right? To like build name recognition in the community, and you're doing everything you need to. That's that's really exciting. Um, okay, yeah. let's assume you're going to be elected because I think you are. Um, so when you get to Congress, um, what do you think would be your biggest priorities in terms of trying to fix the Democratic Party? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you think they need? to do and stop doing like what would be your way of trying to like make them suck less on a national <laughs> level and make them focus more on the things that matter like fixing democracy voting rights climate change like what what do you think would be your main project like long-term project yeah i mean there's so many but i will tell you what i think is the most corrupting influence in politics is corporate money um yeah. it, it's where good policy dies and it's where bad policy is born. It influences every aspect of what the government is trying to do. Uh, and, and we've seen it right over and over and over mm. and over. It always plays out virtually the same way. Um, so that is something that I feel very passionately about that we, we absolutely, you know, I, I, I wrote the paid by act resolution. We talked about that the last time I was on the show. Uh, but ultimately we need to overturn citizens United. That is going to be a little bit of a long-term progress, but I, I or a little bit of a long-term plan. I am continually inspired by progressives, by grassroots that are stepping up all over this country to demand better, um, you know, that actually are living the values that, you know, the Democratic Party purports to stand for. So, you know, what we're hoping to do with this race now, now remember, like part of a good significant chunk of my district as it stands today is in Long Island, um, which, you know, can, you know, there, there's a fair amount of conservatives here as well. Um, but, you know, we're hoping to really set the example here that when we stand for something, when we fight for people, when we invest in our communities uh, and, and really put a vision out for that, people will vote for something, you know, and that's that's very exciting. So I, I think we need to do more of that. We need to step away from this. Um, what I what I believe is very cowardly, right? Um, you know, not wanting to, uh, you know, stand in our truth and stand in our values or combat ridiculous narratives that have nothing to do with what we're trying to accomplish. And unfortunately, you know, we're in this place where I hear all the time from representatives, oh, well, I can't speak out too publicly on, you know, X because of my right. re-election. And it's like, well, no, don't, this is why you serve, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, so for me, I, I would like us to, like, look, of course, you know, we, we want to make sure we have enough Democrats or, you know, progressive Democrats to pass policy. Absolutely. But what good is it? it what good is building power if we're not going to use that power to help people? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, okay, one thing that I wanted to ask you, and I feel like out of all the the topics that are easy to persuade people on, it really is Medicare for all and healthcare. Mm -hmm. Like I've talked about how my mom, who is not very politically savvy, was able to convince Trump supporters that we know to support Bernie Sanders on the basis of, do you want Medicare for all or do you not? Um, so you've converted people from ACA to Medicare for all. Now I find liberals uh who who are very like staunch aca supporters a little bit more difficult honestly than people who have no knowledge of healthcare whatsoever because it, to me i noticed that it's somewhat and this is a generalization it's more supporting it out of loyalty to obama for example and you you want that legacy to remain intact how do you like what's effective how do you convert them to aca supporters into medicare for all supporters yeah. Um, so where we have found a tremendous amount of success uh, is, you know, through house parties or Zoom events oh, okay. um, and, and bringing small groups together. Uh, and, and here's what I found, you know, whether you like it or not, it works. When I start talking about healthcare policy, I start describing Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. I go into the details. We talk about it all. And everyone in the room says, wow. Yeah, that sounds like a great policy. And I'm like, right. And that's Medicare for all. And then you see their heads kind of explode. Mm. And they're like, wait, what? That's not what I heard. You know, and I, I think it's really like, look, nobody 
likes to be told, well, you're wrong or you know, your opinion yeah, doesn't yeah. matter. You're yeah. not winning anyone over with that, right? So I think it's really about meeting people where they're at and then really explaining what the policy is because, you know, I really truly believe that most progressive policies, not all, but, you know, let's, let's for, you know, just for a measure, good measure here, let's say most progressive policy is common sense policy that uplifts, yeah. you know, wh- all or, you know, wide um, array of folks, right? So when we're able to really get into it and talk to people without the pretense and without folks feeling attacked, I find people flood in and, and you can build a lot of support that way. But, you know, it's time consuming. You have to you have to mm-hmm. be ready to do the work and organize and and educate. But it really works. Yeah, that, that's actually really great advice, because if you just say, hey, this is why you should support, support Medicare for all. Once you say the title, they have all these preconceived ideas about why it's bad. Oh, that's tied to Bernie and socialism and communism. And so like they have all a million ideas in their head. But mm-hmm. if you just explain it to them and then you say, well, that's Medicare for all as you did. I, I could see how that would be effective. That makes a lot of sense. I, I really like that. that's a good tactic that I hope that my viewers listen to in convincing their family members. It works. It works. And I think, too, you know, the times that we find ourselves in these days, you uh, you know, we're still in this pandemic. I yeah. think, you know, for the first time and probably a lot of, you know, a lot of those folks who are staunch ACA supporters, maybe they found themselves a little unsure in terms of job security, right? And what happens when your job goes away? Well, so does your insurance, unless you want to pay three times the cost, right? Um, I think it helped people really reevaluate uh, that healthcare conversation. And I saw folks really flip over that way as well. Yeah, yeah, it, it's... It's really fascinating to see that the way that candidates across the country frame it. So in New York, you kind of really just you just have to explain it to them in uh, more conservative districts. I have candidates say, well, you know, I actually frame it in a somewhat conservative sounding way. And I pitch it as a small business tax cut, which is actually a really great selling point because it it technically is. Um, is. So, yeah, like different things work for different people. And it's really important that we meet people where they are. I'm saying this to mostly remind myself of it. As my viewers know, I kind of get too preachy. But, you know, it's it's important. Uh, You know, this is about making progress, changing minds and it's really a long a long project you know it's not mm-hmm. something that we're going to accomplish in a couple of years uh so melly i mean all of my viewers they already they know you they're familiar with you they want you in congress we all want you in congress we need you in congress tell us what we could do to help you make that a reality uh we know you need money but do you need any volunteers phone bankers if we don't live in new york three how can we help you from across the country yeah, so uh, if you go to Dorigo2022, that's D-A-R-R-I-G-O 2022.com, uh, you can sign up to be a volunteer. Absolutely. Uh, I tell everybody, if you want to get involved in this campaign, I promise we have a job for you. Uh, you know, and whether that's phone banking or you want to help research or, you know, there, there's just tons of different ways to get involved. This campaign is growing exponentially. It feels like every minute. So we're always looking for more folks to get involved. Um, but we also do need money. So if it's you know, if you can make a contribution, you can go to donate to Melanie.com. That's M-E-L-A-N-I-E. And you can make a contribution that way. And I do want to just do a plug because I know I, you know, years ago, I used to think, well, I don't have money to donate to mm-hmm. a candidate because I always thought I had to donate this large amount of money. And listen, it all helps. But, you know, frankly, if you have $5 a month to give or $10 a month to give, or you can even give $5 one time, all of it is immensely, immensely helpful. And, uh, you know, for campaigns like mine, grassroots campaigns, we stretch that dollar as far as we can. So it really helps. So if you're able to make a contribution, this is a race you definitely want to invest in because it's one of our best chances to elect another progressive to the House. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you is yeah. that I don't know if you have this information available, if you've crunched it yet. Uh, uh, do you know how much it costs uh estimated to like reach a voter in your district like some candidates say they can do it for two bucks or a dollar like what is what is the estimated cost to reach an actual voter in your district yes well you know in the last election uh it it ended up being about nine dollars a voter Mm. which we actually felt was pretty good um, mm-hmm. This time, we're going to have to reach a lot more voters. It's a little bit of a different election this time around. Uh, the gubernatorial ele- uh, primary will be on the same day, which, you know, mm-hmm. th- there'll be a-, a larger voter turnout. So we're going to reach a lot more. Um, although I will say, you know, we're working with um, we have a fabulous team and, uh, you know, they're, they're crunching and reevaluating, you know, numbers uh, as we speak. Well, yeah. Yeah. So for your district, I mean, if you donate ten dollars and you're watching this, you can help Melanie uh, reach 
one more voter. If a hundred of you do this, I mean, think think of the impact that we can have. And some of these races, they are super, super close. Um, so even if you feel as if like that isn't going to make a difference, it will make a difference because I mean, if every penny counts in these races, when you aren't taking big money, you've got to, you know, you've got to make up for that. So, you know, these small grassroots donations are really important. Melanie, thank you so much for coming on the program. We'll be talking shortly about a, uh, different subject, helping candidates. And if you want to run. So, uh, yeah, I really, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate it.